Episode 6 opens with Shugo frantically searching for Reina, unable to contact her in any way. If you didn't catch on, yes, the rest of the series revolves around saving Reina from being a lost one. And yes, this does aggravate the hell out of me, mainly because Reina is wearing Black Rose's guise in the game. Look, Black Rose was never a damsel in distress as Reina has regularly been, despite her experiences in the game. Black Rose was Kite's partner and equal even if she didn't bear the power of the bracelet. Here, Reina's either the incompetent mentor or the prize. Now, it's noble and emotional for Shugo to want nothing more than to help his sister, but it's tarnished by the whole character model contest because they embody the legacy of the partner's characters, and Reina's arc is downright insulting to Black Rose. Why? Black Rose had Shugo's arc to saving her brother, and she actually went about doing it with a level of competence. Which is yet again another reason why I so despise this series. Because intentionally or no, Cybernetic 2's dot hack stories after I mock keep doing this to Black Rose. Either sidelining her importance, pretending she didn't exist, or have a role in Kite's story, or insult her. The only exceptions that have existed for this are the Another Birth novels and Project Frickin' Cross Zone. It really should not be so hard to get a decent depiction of the character. Shugo tries to use Grunty to track Rain and Down through digital smell. I'd complain about this, but it's not that far of a stretch, considering when Grunties were used in the areas, they could be used to find Grunty fruit through some type of gameplay dynamic. Sanjuro sends Balmug and Reki an update, the Azure Sky sadly not thinking of ordering the message on to Kamui, and informing the woman that her actions caused them to miss an opportune moment to get on the hacker Brad's trail, and cost them another player to comatose status. Eventually, the hacker brats prepare their next trap for Kite, sending him a message with an area keyword, their next monster disguising itself as Reina. To Shugo's credit, he instantly catches on that it's not Reina, its mannerisms too far from the ones he's known since her birth. The monster, afterwards, being quickly data-drained. In a meeting with Balmog, he reveals to the group what he's been able to discover, that the character contest was not CC Corp's doing, and Shugo and Reina have been the targets of whatever's doing this. And of course, only now does Shugo learn of Reina's comatose state, despite how much time should have passed by this point. How can that be? Well, I'll spoil it for you. Reina and the rest of the Lost Ones in this crisis have had their PCs placed under powerful mental suggestions and teleported to a server that is still under construction and not fully part of the world yet. Thus, Aura's connection and dominion over it is tenuous at best, especially with specialized firewalls designed to keep her out and would have supported an initial theory that someone at CC Corp was behind this to study the effects of the digital comas using the hacker brats as potential patsies, as that would actually fit the greater lore of the franchise. But it's not, though. The real reason is far more stupid. Shugo checks Reina's equipment as the family briefly reunites, the pair's parents learning from the doctors of her condition, identical to that of the Lost Ones four years before whose causing factors have become more common knowledge, even though that is contradicted in literally every other part of the franchise. Shugo, of course, learning she's still logged in. In an unknown location, Aura finds Reina's body stuck between the space and world, and helps her recover out of the hypnotic suggestion, describing her as dead. However, Aura's power is limited here. You see what I mean about how things would have been worse had these guys continued their standard modus operandi instead of being put under Leos? They would have done their best to delete any of the data bugs that would have given clues to the truth of the problem instead of quarantining them for analysis like Leos did. And there would have been a hell of a lot more casualties. Yes, Leos was a pig-headed idiot, but he was trying to do what he could to save everyone he could. He went about it the wrong way initially, yes, but he was ultimately working towards the same goal as everybody else. Reki has managed to finally find a trail, an illegal teleport used on Rana's character, as Balmug reveals more of the details to the uninformed among them about the Twilight Incidents. This inspires Shugo to head out into the open, deciding to lure out another hacked monster to him. His plan? With the admins aware of what's going on, they can check the data of it both in battle and once he's data drained it, so they can find a trail that might lead to where the Lost Ones are hidden. Unfortunately, the latter half of the plan is destroyed by Komion's untimely appearance him getting hit with a skill at the same time Shugo runs out of skill points. And attempting to repeat the plan is then blocked by who else but the Cobalt Knights, who delete the monster without a second thought to analyzing its data to combat or track the threat. Once again, 
You imbeciles. Yeah, the reason you weren't called in over this is because you would screw it up. And guess what? You screwed it up. With Kamui, she is, as I said, doing her job without care to those who have been affected by events and had a plan which could have worked. Not only losing the lead to the culprits, but mocking Bulma and the company for what she views as a screw-up. Seeing the entire thing as a personal insult to herself and the Cobalt Knights that she wasn't called in, as informed by her informant, Reki. And now I'm just waiting for this all to blow up in her face. And now, Kamui suddenly has the authority to remove Balmug, taking all of his administrative duties for the time being, even though he was solving the problem by working with these people. Yeah, no. See, what happens when you impose martial law in a video game is, since it's a video game, the players stop playing. If it's no longer fun, they quit. If they quit, CC Corp loses money, and if the company is losing money, then they crack down on the cause of it. And need I remind you that CC Corp has a long history of using their most informed personnel and division heads as scapegoats. You should know this. It happened with your former boss that you were in love with. Hell, if you pretended to count this series as canon infected in the Mama Conspiracy retcon, this actually makes it worse, as then they'd legitimately lose their means of test betting their trap everyone in cyberspace, idiot plot. Keep players happy and oblivious to the chaos in the system is good for their bottom line. Not declaring digital martial law. However, it will be some time before that is shown, as with free rent to do as she sees fit, the Cobalt Knights don't go after the hackers that are causing this. Oh no, that would be the smart thing. Hell, she doesn't even try to track them down or trace member address activity for all the affected fields to correlate suspects. Nope. She goes after common players. Common players that have violated their user agreement by adding mods to their characters or equipment and just publicly executing their characters. Only after which she bans their accounts. Her justification? She's using them as examples to those who would break the laws of the world. Data Drain does not work that way on player characters. What the hell? In the meantime, Shogo's been hunting more bugged monsters with the others as Balmug tries to convince the company Kamui will only make things worse. Remember this. The brats are still laying low, smart enough to know not to draw attention to themselves until they're ready to teach Kamui a lesson, learning that Rain is awake in their little prison. And we learn that the brats were taught how to do all of this, meaning that they're all being used. And then Komeyan leads Kamui to Shugo, the debugger witnessing the PC's abnormal state, with still a remnant of data drain left on them. Of course, had they even considered checking the records for the abnormalities, which Balmog would have correlated for them or asked Reki to, they would find that while recent occurrences have revolved around Shugo and Rena, many of them predate their first login. Coupled with a victim being his sister in the system's history with the Twilight Bracelet, a history Kamui should be aware of, it should mark him as a person of interest and to be martyred and put on guard, not outright accused of being the perpetrator. Oh, wait, right, I forgot. I'm smarter than the characters in this goddamn series. And of course, the Cobalt Knights target Shugo, blaming him for everything that has gone wrong in the world with the Lost Ones. Thanks for that, Twilight Bracelet, just... Thanks for using a redeemed minor antagonist turned ally to punctuate how out of character and unforgivable Kamui is acting. Oh, by the way, he shows up in .hack roots briefly, so clearly that account ban didn't stick. Because... this series is non-canon. It's not like they can even delete his character, considering, again, Leos tried that several times without any effect thanks to the protections woven into the bracelet and that of anyone else with pieces of the epitaph. However, Shugo gets help, from a familiar character. I return to the world after all this time, and I find the streets ruled by a pack of gangsters calling themselves knights. How wretched are these times. Yep, it's Silver Knight. Surprisingly, without his Subaru obsession, he's taking a level of badass, fighting off the Cobalt Knights and allowing Shugo to escape. However, this has consequences for the man. His character strung up like all the others and sends to deletion, despite not actually breaking any parts of the user agreements. He calls her out among the assembled players on her hypocrisy and abuse of party doctrine for her own selfish whims. But that changes nothing. Silver Knight facing total digital oblivion. Yes, because screaming fuck on the internet is a reason to ban a player from a video game. 
Only while someone else is posting uncensored neo-Nazi propaganda without an admin doing jack. And that's speaking from experience with Final Fantasy XIV and World of Warcraft's chat channels, that they literally don't give a damn if you're spewing racist hate speech crap, but God forbid you use a naughty word. And things continue to get worse for Balmog, Reiki having informed the system administrators under Kamui's order that Balmog continued to work on solving the crisis while Kamui's been doing nothing about it, having him formally fired from the company in continuing her pointless, needless spite. But there's a light in the darkness. Reina, with Aura's help, has gotten enough information on where she is to send Shuga a message detailing the keywords of the area, and sends him the message. New protections go up to seal the server from Aura, but the message manages to get through nonetheless. Kamui's gang, because really, they're nothing but at this point, continues the crackdown of players, going for even more petty violations than before. Until, you know, CC Corp shuts down the servers like they were going to do four years ago to remove the problem, which would have killed every coma victim and wiped the servers, you idiot! And they're also continuing the search for Shugo, as he prefers to head with the group to where Reyna is trapped. Reki surprisingly is helpful despite his double agent status, informing them of the message originating from a locked server. Of course, by now, he's informed Kamui, but it'll take a bit of time for her to finish her fun of deleting players that haven't actually done anything wrong. So the team distracts and disables the knights at the Chaos Gate, and Sanjuro reveals the gate-hacking skill to Shugo, which they use to warp to the area, and are immediately confronted by the Hacker Brats. Now we can just destroy all of those kids! What are they doing here? Don't be fooled by their appearance. These are the masterminds behind all this. Though they had a plan in place, it wasn't meant for them. Their targets are actually the Cobalt Knights, who choose only now to log in, the Brats revealing their newest hacked monster. The Knights are summarily slaughtered in droves as Kamui does nothing but quote doctrine and attack Shugo, who she still believes to be behind this, without any corroborating evidence to support that belief. Yeah, so glad she was put in charge of the division. It's not like she cares at all if her men are being sent into comas around her, even though her boss suffering from that before was extremely traumatizing to her. With her enemies being slaughtered, the quartet gloat that soon the world will be theirs and theirs alone. Yes, our bad guy isn't CC Corp, it's not Kamui, and it isn't the Hacker Brats, as we thought. It is instead this thing that's been behind everything that has manipulated the Brats and captured all the Lost Ones, even though everyone else so far besides it has actually been more malicious. And we're never actually given an explanation of its origins, whether it's a lost piece of Morgana created after her death, or just another vagrant AI created by the Black Box file after Aura's true birth. We just don't know. Oh, and its motivations in all this? Well, it wants to learn the nature of death. That's it. You want to know why that's really stupid? Surprisingly, the monster disappears, reformatted into the body of our true bad guy, a vagrant AI named Morty. <laughs> and unlike in Dodak GU, where there's an actual reason why vagrant AI can't get data from the phases of the Cursed Wave anymore that plays a central part in what happens in that era, there isn't one here as Skaith is still part of the system at this moment and collecting data on death to disseminate to all vagrant AI so they understand it. Because we already had a creature in the world dedicated to this, and it did it by merely analyzing character data of players whose characters died. What was its name again? Oh, right, it's the first phase of the Cursed Wave of the Epitaph. Skaith, the Terror of Death. Yeah, it's floating around as part of the AI Sora that's still canonically running around the place as the memories of being Sora never went back to Ryo Masaki until GU's events. So it should be more than capable of feeding data on that phenomena to Morty in order for him to get it without creating coma victims or any system aberrancies as he has. I'd call him a dumb AI, but this is imbecilic even for them since dumb AI usually just means a specialized program that does tasks for you, without real sentience, as opposed to something like Aura or Halo's Cortana that are smart AI. Hell, Siri and Amazon Alexa are technically classifiable as dumb AI. This is... I don't even know what to call this, as there's literally no reason for it to be doing this. Morty starts tearing the area apart, even killing three of her pawns, which prompts Shugo to get them the hell out of there. It's too bad he didn't wait a bit longer, though, as finally escaping the dungeon comes Rena. 
Too late to make it inside the Sigil, signifying an area hacking teleport. Stella! Wait, no, I used that joke last time. As Kamui finally realizes what happened to her men. Naturally, CC Corp brings down the hammer on her conduct, removing her from her station, which leaves Reki as their next choice of administrative officer. Or, you know, they could have reinstated Balmog as he was doing all of the right things to go about fixing this while keeping the common players unaware of problems so it doesn't affect the company's bottom line before he gave Kamui the authority to screw up everything and make players want to leave the game while not accomplishing anything towards resolving the crisis. You see what I mean about CC Corp being the bad guys even when they aren't the bad guys? There's a reason the theory of them being the silent backers of the Brats held weight initially. I would remind you all this crisis would have neared its end far before this had Kamui's gang not intervened in Shugo's plan several episodes ago. The Brat's super weapon against the Knight wouldn't have been ready, Morty would have been less powerful, and they could have gotten the Lost Ones out of the area so they could recover and remove the logout block. So, yeah, now that the rest of the team is no longer forced into hiding, they can go out and prepare for the final battle as Reki tracks down the information on the lock server. And, you know, I don't get Reki. He betrays Balmug, but doesn't actually betray him, rats on them to Kamui, but works against them, takes the position of the administrator, but defers to those he got removed. He says it's because he wanted Balmug acting like the Azure Sky again, the man he was during the Twilight Incident, but I will remind you all that Balmug didn't start acting like the Azure Sky until he got his ass handed to him and manipulated by the system administrators, then finally recruited by Kite. Before all of that, he was an idiot being led by his nose. Just because he's been a conformist doesn't mean he wasn't acting like the Azure Sky. In fact, Reki's actions broke the Azure Sky, as he's been doing nothing but moping since he was fired. And now he wants Balmug to man up again? Up yours, you slimy prick. Thus, Reki hands over the master key needed to get into the secret, still under construction root town, where Morty's hold himself up. The capital of illusion, Nebel Mond. Monsters begin spawning, and their fight is on. And worse, they're immune to data dra- Okay, no. 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 No, 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 no. There is one rule that doesn't change in .hack. Data Drain, when it's performed by the Twilight Bracelets or the phases at least, and as long as it's being properly cast on a Protect Broken Enemy, always works. Always. Assuming all of that is true and they didn't fuck that up again like they did earlier, it is because they have been given permission by the system to work and surpass the normal limitation to deal with exactly this sort of anomaly. Sure, in the game's sign in GU, its full effects only applies if it's used to protect broken enemies, but otherwise there is an infliction of damage and status effects. But this casting didn't have the attack go wild, and protect break doesn't seem to matter at all in Legend of the Twilight Bracelet's version of things. Hell, the only time I'm aware where Data Drain doesn't work is when it's used by the Sophia drones developed by CC Corp in the 2020s of the franchise's timeline, and there it's because what they developed wasn't true data drain, but a patchwork facsimile whose basis was data deletion, not reversion like the real data drain is. Thus, yeah, this is bullcrap. Balmug leads a team to fortify themselves, they are managing to pin the monster so data drain does suddenly work. Gee, what a complete waste of time. Then, Morty appears, rewriting the data of the area, and summoning an army of zombie NPCs. Oh god, what if they were all voiced by Bob Pappenbrook? Kamui shows herself to Reki, revealing she looked at the Hacker Brat's PCs and background data, them all having a macabre obsession with death, likely why Morty approached them with her plan. Wait, what was her plan? She hasn't actually killed anyone yet. She just put them in a delusion that makes them think they're dead that was powerful enough to invoke the out-of-body coma effect. ...and killing being better! Look, I planned this! So explain it! Yeah, well, a lot of innocent people died! Yes, there was a little collateral damage, probably not important. My plan is great! Then and then Kamui points out why this entire thing was a waste of time. Using Reki as a case study, PKing him, only for him to return a moment later. Yeah, there's a reason Skate is called the Terror of Death. We fear death because we don't understand what happens to us beyond death. 
where our consciousness, our soul, everything that was once part of our essence goes as our evacuated bodies decay. MMOs are a great case study for this. As while the fear of death isn't the same as it is in permanent, we still avoid it for the same reason. Loss of time, loss of advantage, loss of investment. It invokes an overall negative emotional response that can be extrapolated to the truth behind it. Hell, some MMOs have proven themselves to actually provide real tangible data and case studies for death. Specifically, in World of Warcraft's early days, a programming oversight allowed a dungeon short-term plague effect to escape the limits of that area by piggybacking off a hunter's pet, and then proximity to that pet caused the plague debuff to spread to other players, with the effect eventually causing every player affected to die because the item that removed the plague was dungeon locked and there wasn't enough time to get back to it before people died. It got so bad, the admins had to do a complete server character reset to cleanse it, and a later patch fixed the problem. But the incident actually proved to work as a real world case study on how diseases in the real world actually spread as it perfectly matched the modes of travel and how infections actually spread over time. Once again, even in a really awful anime, Dot .hack is predictive of the future in its first two eras of content. But people like Kamui, they don't see it like that. They see it in the view of nothing but data, as immaterial, as any death in a game having no meaning. And Morty and the remaining hacker brats see it the same way. Viewing death as a game, which matches the reasons of why they've been so cavalier about sending them into comas. They didn't know it works like that. The brats not knowing, nor caring about it. Ricky shows a monster he captured, again something that was attempted and they prevented five episodes ago, and have found Morty's actual plan. Complete castating destruction of the system. However, the system is protected by Aura, and seeing how things are going, she initiated the character contest to bring back the two that saved the world before. Why she didn't just contact Kite and Akira and ask for their help, I really don't know. They probably wouldn't have screwed it up. Reina and Shugo have thus been targeted because they are also her specially created weak points, until the pair were strong enough to combat the threats, or would keep intervening to keep them safe, which brings her out into the open, which Morty and the Brats could then acquire data on her, or lead her into a trap. Aura is unnecessary, so she will be completely erased. Considering Morty's goal is complete deletion, yeah, I'd say she would be unnecessary to manage the system which would cease to exist. A monster attacks and consumes Reyna, using it as a catalyst to transfer a virus to every player in the game using their member addresses, and the infected members' member addresses, and so on and so forth. And since Reyna's PC was created specially by Aura, the virus has a backdoor into her as well. It makes you wish that Aura would have foreseen this and given her a special item or alteration as well. It's not like she has a special connection to Shugo or anything that would make her want to give him something alone. But, nope, just the bracelet given to her brother without reason. Aura appears within the monster, slowing its progression while the others figure out what to do to free her. Though, using the bracelet is discouraged. Which makes a bit of sense. After all, who knows what would happen to a person trapped in the game if they were data-drained. It continues to confound me that it regularly appears that the people behind this have both seen .hack and yet have not seen .hack. Actually, they are uncertain whether Data Drain would even work to remove the virus in the same way it infected everyone else. And a true death will come to this world. Please, he's three years off from creating his second character while half his memories are floating around as a vagrant AI. However, there's another figure among them. Komayan. The brat who so far had zero relevance to anything. Now initially one would think that's because he's been data drained repeatedly and data drain gives him immunity to the virus. Or, alternatively, removing all of his member addresses so he couldn't be infected. But the real reason is, he has no member addresses of other players and never had them ever. This proves to them that a stupid plan of casting data drain on the lot to temporarily remove the virus would be a good thing. So while the freshly arrived Kamui holds it off, Shugo casts the rarely used Data Drain Arc, cleansing them. Bulma gives the advice that won him the title of the Azure Sky, that every monster ultimately has a weakness, and they attack to find it. And sure enough, the weakness is a narrow window when the virus levels peak in Reyna's PC, that Shugo can Data Drain it away without harming Reyna. 
He succeeds, leaving only Morty and the last of the hacker brats. They attack, but Morty, oddly enough, defends the PC, named Michi. Wait, what? You use her to continue your plans about discovering the truth of death, and now you protect one of your pawns? Actually, no. Right after this, it's revealed that this is still part of Morty's plot to learn the truth of death. Her own essence bearing a backup of the virus that begins to spread through the Chaos Gates. And the reason she protected Michi? Well, Michi's the one that got the damn ball started, planning the idea of researching death in the game world into the vagrant AI's head when she encountered it to give it purpose, primarily to deal with her own grief over the death of one of her parents. We don't learn which one, but Cliché would tell us it's the mother. Thus, this was all to learn if there really is some place we go after death. As I implied earlier, I don't have the answer to that. No one really does. Religion says we'll go to a place that suits the lifestyles we lived, but while it's comfort to some, it doesn't take away the terror we feel at that deciding moment, or the pain such a loss leaves behind. In addition, this is why you get kids therapy when their parents or guardians know they're having a hard time getting over it. A responsible individual would have nipped this in the bud. Hell, once more, this is all dealt with in GU and far more maturely. However, this revelation also brings it back to Shu and Reina, and what the game brought them. Years ago, someone once said that death is like parting. But now, people who have been separated by time or distance have a chance to meet in the world. I'd like to think there's a place where we can meet those who've passed away and be together again. And here's where it comes to the central question of this whole anime alternate universe. Why Black Rose when all that was needed was Kite? The sensible answer would have been this one. Yeah, Black Rose broke the bracelet. Something only possible, at least we presume, in the presence of Kubia, an event that might have altered her PC data. Something Aura could recreate and embed into the character data she gifted Reyna. Thus, breaking the bracelet again would, could only be done by Reyna, and could act as a pseudo Corbidic and reset the system to save it from a cascade failure. The reality, though, is... a lot more stupid. Reyna just grabs on Shugo when the bracelet simply resonates, a pair diving into the corrupted cascades, which purifies the corrupted data. That was anticlimactic, and completely nonsensical. The credits for the final episode roll, and we get a minor epilogue, Balma being reinstated as administrator and back to creating new events, one of which the group is preparing to take part in, as they wait for the separated siblings to come online and spend time with their friends and each other. This series is horrible. It did ironically pick up after shredding the adapted stories behind it, as said adaptations were frankly terrible. As I have stated many times before, to properly do an adaptation or utilize the characters someone else created, you need to be respectful to their source material and the characters involved in it, and you need to tell a story that doesn't suck. The fact that Tatsuya Hamazaki had not finished more than the first volume of the manga when this went into production tells much of what they were expecting instead of waiting until he at least had half the full story scripted out. I'll be detailing the overarching story of the manga next time, but it's a hell of a lot better than this. When they dropped the stupid fan service and perverse incest overtones, things did improve. A bit. Shugo's journey to save his sister is a noble one, and reflective of the wish by Rana to see him become a hero, though that is more the manga incarnation and not this one. Something that is not in any way explained or utilized in the anime, but is in the manga. However, I think it would have been better had Reyna not been using the Black Rose character model. CyberConnect 2's writers on the .hack project seem to have a vendetta against Akira Black Rose Hayami, demonizing her or excluding her in later productions past that of the Another Birth novels to either focus solely on Kite or make the Azure Flame look far better by comparison. And this anime is essentially making her, through the XP of Reyna, into the damsel in distress she certainly is not. The ruination of Kamui's character cannot be ignored either. She's a workaholic addicted to her duties, as she saw imposed upon her as the legacy of her mentor, Kazushi Waterai, aka Alba Rio. But by attacking anyone with a mod instead of seeking ways to combat the threat and defeat its source, she completely alienates herself from that irreparably. The Brat Quartet and Morty are terrible villains, as they're really just rehashing Skate's whole deal with none of the style turning the dealing of death into nothing more than a childish game. 
There is a reason Skate was intimidating and terrifying as it did what it did once manifested by Morgana with a cold, uncaring precision as was indicative of the phases. It was a part of a greater consciousness and a harbinger of the destruction to come as Morgana literally tore itself apart trying to stop the birth of her child. That insanity is terrifying as it comes from a source that is completely alien to our own existence. A decision reached by an entity born of and restricted by pure total logic to break everything she is. These kids? They're petulant brats getting their jollies off by doing things that in their world warrants capital punishment. That's a decent source for an antagonist, but you need to build a setting where that is capable to be played off of for a larger themology, like it is in Dothack GU with the prevalence of player killers. And yeah, I'm serious about that. The whole Pluto's Kiss thing? They instated the death penalty for hackers after that in this universe. They should damn well know better, as never before nor since has anyone in .hack acted so carelessly with malevolent data. Short of CC Corp themselves, the GU's ultimate villain, the antagonist of Quantum and the Mama Cult, but we'll get to why it's subverted for them, too. I can certainly sympathize with what Michi was going through, the death of a loved one, and her methods and how to cope, but it came too late to affect the overall opinion of a crappy series. Maybe had Michi been introduced on her own and her reasons been built up and explored more than some final exposition in the final episode, it might have had more impact. But as it is, it's just a minor footnote on a show whose viewers tuned out long before this was revealed to us. CZ Corp, though, is actually in fucking character. The executives are bastards who work against themselves and the safety of its users with their policies. That is something that has not changed nor will it ever. Oka, Sanjuro, Balmog, and Hotaru do decent jobs, even if Sanjuro is a bit more laid back than what I'm used to, and Hotaru is inexplicably a girl. Overall, no complaints. But Reki infuriates me. He is a badly used red herring whose true agenda, even at the end, is unknown. I would equate him to Zelos the trickster priest from Slayers, but at least with Zelos we know he's a demon that gains sustenance from tormenting others. Reki is just inconsistent. While the music is good and I did enjoy some of the overtones of sadness with the sibling's broken family, and had they focused on that, this would have been a better series, the comedy that's part of much of the series falls flat, there's nothing to really expand the mythos of the world, and since the last David episodes do not follow the canon manga, much of the series might as well have never happened, so there's no point in sitting through it. So, seriously, skip this shitty anime and buy the manga. It's got some problems, yeah, but at least the damn writing is consistent and I'll be describing the events of the series the anime did not cover when I talk about the novels of the first era, which will also include AI Buster, Another Birth, and X-Fourth. I'm Dashinta, and I'll see you all next time.